want to officially welcome you uh, to this lecture. We're delighted to be hosting it. My name is Thomas Boehm, and I'm uh, one of the co-sponsors. Uh, I'm with Faith for All, the founder and director of Faith for All, which is an organization that is designed to go out into the faith community and help support congregations in becoming places of inclusion for people with special needs. So Faith for All works to accelerate congregation uh, accessibility so people with special needs can have deeper access into the community life of a congregation. And uh, it's been a real treat to spend the day with Tom Reynolds and the various meetings. Some of you have been uh, a part of some meetings earlier today. But really, um, one of the things that you can pick up on the way out that we want to let you know about is to save the date for a conference coming up October 5th. And it's the first annual Congregation Inclusion Conference. And uh, we're going to be trying to bring together representatives from the faith community here in Nashville, representatives from agency service providers here in Nashville, as well as family members from Nashville. And some people wear multiple hats. Uh, but uh, you can pick up some flyers on all of this out there. And if you want to sign up for some updates on Faith for All, there's a card that you can do that uh, for. And I'll introduce one of our other co-sponsors, uh, Ellen Armour, to, uh, with the Carpenter Program. And uh, before we hear from Thomas Reynolds. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ellen Armour, and I teach here at the Divinity School, teach theology, and I also direct the Carpenter Program in Religion, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. And among the many things that the Carpenter Program attempts to do is to build links between um, issues related to gender and sexuality and religion and other issues that, um, that, that impact directly on, um, on those matters. So we're particularly delighted to be able to host, to co-host this lecture and to bring back uh, Tom Reynolds, who is an alum of this fine institution. So it's, it's doubly wonderful for us. Um, so on behalf of the Divinity School and the Carpenter Program, I welcome you. And now I'll turn it over to Courtney Taylor. Here she is. Hello, everyone. My name is... Hello. <laughs> Um, my name is Courtney Taylor, and I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Dissemination at the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, and we are also a sponsor of this lecture, and we welcome you. Um, the Kennedy Center's mission is really to um, improve the lives of uh, people with disabilities and their families. And one of the ways that we do this is through um, providing supports to them um, when they want to be included in communities. One of those communi communities is certainly uh, the faith community. And so it's through our Disabilities, Religion, and Spirituality program that we're able to offer training to current and future religious leaders and then the pro provide supports to those families as they need uh, help being supported uh, to be included. Um, it's also through this program that we're able to bring Tom Reynolds here today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Tom Reynolds. He's an incredible theologian and a wonderful person. And we've had a very great day talking with him. Um, as Ellen said, Tom walked these very hallways not that long ago as an MTS student and then eventually graduated with his PhD in, um, in uh, theology and in the history of Christian thought. During that time, he also played music professionally, um, both as a studio and as a touring musician, um, until he finally decided to finish his dissertation and <laughs> landed his first uh, job as assistant professor of religious studies at St. Norbert College in Wisconsin. He currently serves as associate professor of theology at Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto. He's, published, he's been published in a number of theological journals and is the author of several books, including The Broken Whole, Philosophical Steps Towards a Theology of Global Solidarity, Remembering Ourselves Differently, Theology and Christian Identity in a Global and Pluralist Era, and then one that is very relevant for our, our talk today, which is Vulnerable Communion, A Theology of Disability and Hospitality, which is an excellent read, and I encourage you to go out and pick that up if you haven't already. So Thomas, uh, Tom's lecture today is entitled Beyond Inclusion, Rethinking Normalcy, Identity, and Disability in Theological Terms. And it is my pleasure to introduce Tom Reynolds. No mic in the room, so tell me if I'm projecting enough in the back. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank Courtney for the hospitality 
I want to thank Ellen and the Carpenter Program for sponsoring this, and Thomas and the Faith for All Program. It's been a lively day full of rich conversation, um, much food for thought that I'll take back home with me, even though this is home. In fact, I'm quite intimidated to stand in the halls of a place where I was once intimidated as a student. <laughs> Um, with friends and professors uh, from years ago, the years pass quickly, so it's, it's a gift for me to be here, and I really thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with a story that I heard, a story that made me cringe. Speaking to a group of about 20 attentive listeners was an articulate, compassionate, and successful business person in his early 60s. He was quietly recalling his public rejection by a priest. Some years ago, as he approached a church after, for communion during worship, a priest singled him out and said to him, exclaiming loudly and with severe disgust, we don't serve drunks here. True, this man talks with slurred speech and moves with a jolted gait, but he doesn't drink. He has cerebral palsy. This story unsettles me on a number of levels. On the first level, it exemplifies how we can misunderstand someone and exclude on the basis of that misunderstanding. And while the implications extend beyond disability, I mean, just who does this priest serve? What is, what is a religious leader? It raises questions like that. In the case of this particular man, though, the exclusion and the public rejection began there. Ironically, in the very place where one would expect inclusion and welcome to prevail copiously. Of all places, as Jenny Weiss Block notes, our religious communities should be models of accessible communities. A point of entry into God's love radiating in multiple directions through the lives of diverse participants. For example, for Christians, the body of Christ presumes a place for many gifts. But place is a difficult thing for people with disabilities far too often. Often encountered is a threshold that signals access denied, whether physical, behavioral, or attitudinal. And this is tragic for those with and without disabilities that are visible. For, in this case, specific kinds of people are rendered helpless or deficient in some way by others. And on this basis, it, they're excluded from participation, diminishing their genuine humanity. But also, I want to suggest that the communities themselves are diminished. As disabling principalities and powers come to obscure how people with dis disabilities can and do make real contributions to communities. After all, this man was a prominent leader, a model of success. He was neither lacking ability or somehow special simply because of a weakness attributed him to him by others. So I've become convinced over the years, especially because my 19-year-old son is autistic and has faced the kind of public exclusion that this man experienced. And I, as a parent, have faced it as an advocate, aligned myself with him and his unique dignity. Because of this, I've been forced to rethink everything theologically from the ground up. And I want us today to begin to rethink a couple of things. I must confess that the overt inclusion, excuse me, the overt exclusion of the story isn't only what unsettles me. Also what unsettles me about the story I related above is scandal on a deeper level. It's my own reaction to the story that bothers me, my cringe, the fact that I go, ooh, and perhaps you did, here when you heard the story, which indicates a kind of attempt to empathetically align with the one excluded and assure myself that I know better, that in similar circumstances, I would never do such a thing. I wouldn't be judgmental or condescendingly reject someone on the basis of my own false pretenses, my own uh, ways of thinking about the world and practices. And instead, I would be inclusive. I would be welcoming. What troubles me is not my good intention, not my well-meaning intention to connect with and affirm another human being,
but rather perhaps a more subtle kind of pretense, one that assumes the authenticity of my own understanding of another, and thus the rightness of its own practice of inclusion. Sometimes the stories we tell about ourselves, the stories about who we are, what we do, or have achieved as communities, especially religious ones, interfere with the genuine work of attending to other persons as they really are, subjects of their own experiences and agents with their own unique voices and ways in the world. I'm speaking about communal practices of care that have inclusion as their focus, and I want to problematize it. I want to problematize care and inclusion, those virtues of what we call ourselves most often, especially in more progressive and liberal traditions, as inclusive. Specifically, in the process of opening access for people with disabilities to participate fully in community life. So the point I'd like to stress here in our few moments together is that the incorporative thrust of inclusion is not innocent. And sometimes it's ill-suited to its stated intention of countering intolerance and exclusion. Put bluntly, efforts by non-disabled people to care for people with disabilities via welcoming and incorporation can be, even with good intentions, deceptively marginalizing and so function implicitly as forms of exclusion. Now, we may go, and I often do in my own life with Chris, not me, not me. I work hard to be inclusive. I want to explore this. But I want to start out by saying I believe it is possible to care for people as both equal and different. That is, as equal, fully human, without therefore being made over and assimilated into the image of what is taken by dominant voices and visions as normal, which effectively erases difference. So equal, not in terms of assimilation but also as different without therefore being marginalized as deviant or abnormal, effectively denying equality and true humanness. My basic axiom is that alterity in the shape of disability is a gift that teaches and empowers community. That's a problematic statement. So I hope to unpack that more as we go on. I just want to put that in quotations here at the start. As Carolyn Thompson writes, disability is about difference. It is one of the characteristics that contributes to the diversity and the plurality of life. And it's such difference that according to Jonathan Sachs in the book The Dignity of Difference, which perhaps some of you know, chief uh, Orthodox rabbi in England, God creates difference as blessed and good such that in, in encountering it, we meet God. That's a quote by Sachs. The roots of the injunction to hospitality, I believe, lie here. So welcoming the full participation of people with disabilities isn't necessarily an option for our religious communities, but rather a defining feature. Not one of the tangential things we can do, but at the core of who we are. Opening up relationships of interdependence and respect and friendship. But when temporarily able-bodied people, and I like that phrase because disability is a continuum on which we all rest, not something for those others. We'll talk more in a little bit about that. But folks in disability studies often say temporarily able-bodied. So I'll just put that out there in the beginning. Practicing care is as mainstreaming or normalizing or rehabilitating. What does that mean? Is that just simply another form of assimilation? Is this really inclusion in the best sense of the word? As disability scholar Patty Douglas notes in her work on autism and education, inclusion often amounts to a process by which people with disabilities, quote, are not only brought into view as a population subject to inclusion, but, are, but also as a population potentially in need of improvement, end of quote. So to be one of us, you have to be remade in our image. Based upon what I have just said about equality and difference, I'd like to propose an alternative to this. To be included entails being made part of and given access to 
intended participation in community, treated as equal among others, like everyone else. To be inclusive, then, means intentionally making room for difference, the different treated as different, not as a pathology or as a deficit or as an opportunity for curative or fixing practices to be, uh, to be made in order for a person to be accepted into the community. The link between these two, inclusion and being inclusive, I think, lies in accommodation. That is, being included as a person with disabilities involves access accommodation so that one can participate with each, other's, with each other as a contributing part of a community's life. And this means recognizing difference and diversity, bodily and neurologically, and welcoming it not only as them, but as us, redefining the us, not as something other, abnormal, out there, to be included and remade in the image of the same, the normal. <coughs> so it's not so much a matter of accommodating you so you can be part of us on our terms, but rather so that you can be with and augment us differently on your terms. And I think of experiences with my son and how I've learned the process of attending and caring on his terms, not mine. I have to continually remind myself of this, I must confess, right here today. Um, so, rather than communal conformity and homogeneity, a communal heterogeneity and diversity is introduced when we think about disabilities. But doesn't being intentional and accommodating persons with disabilities involve a kind of negative othering, making different from the start, by which people without disabilities reduce bodily diversity to disability as something gone wrong, something needing accommodation in the first place. In other words, doesn't even recognizing disability and accepting it as something different than just a, something to be cured, doesn't even that force negative accommodation in the way that I'm trying to avoid. There are serious problems of perception here, serious issues which evoke a number of concepts that raise thorny problems for the way communities think about being inclusive. And I can only raise a couple of them. To clarify what's at stake, I'd like to propose that we, those of us here today, both with and without disabilities, make three shifts. I just want to propose three basic shifts in the way we begin to think about issues of disability. One, the disability is not simply a body gone wrong a problem to be solved physically or medically by, or spiritually by cure or remediated or attended to as an other. That's the first shift, to begin to see disability as not about them, as an other. Secondly, this involves that disability is not simply a problem to be included, an anomaly that is somehow outside of who we are and which needs the good graces of our community in order to be more fully made human, brought inside and given access. For this often becomes a way for temporarily non-disabled people to nobly claim that they're giving something and to feel assured in the good intention. Part of what disturbs me about the story and my cringing, that I wouldn't do such a thing. I don't nobly give to Chris so that as an other, so that he feels included. In fact, if anything, I experience challenges that force me to acknowledge my own deep, deep challenges that shake me to the core of who I am. It's not a noble thing at all. So the second point is I want to re re rethink the us-them dualism in terms of inclusion. It may be true that without accommodation and an impairment does become a disability, but there's more going on than this. So three, outside anything in my preconceived program of caring for Chris, or outside what might fuel our gestures of inclusion in our communities, concepts of what is normal, the status quo in a variety of ways, I want to suggest that disability involves people who are equal and with gifts, differences to offer. Equal and different. It doesn't 
So the first, the first step I just want to highlight briefly, and it doesn't take much to recognize that problems accompany our religious language about God and the way we talk about God's love when it's applied to disability. Encountering disability does disorient communities. We heard some of that today in our conversations. People are afraid. They don't know how to act. They don't know how to th think about it or the right thing to do. So this disorientation challenges the assumptions by which people without disabilities find meaning in the world, find their orientation Christianly or Jewishly in faith communities. And in order to uphold these assumptions, these assumptions about what is normal and what's safe, oftentimes people automatically defer to notions that God somehow causes disability. For example, as a curse or a punishment, a cross to bear, an opportunity for God to heal, a way for non-disabled people to demonstrate charity, a kind of moral lesson for non-disabled people. For example, we've heard probably, and maybe some of us cringe at it, I know I do when I think, there but for the grace of God go I. Statements like that, seriously problematic. Or perhaps we think spiritual uh, people with disabilities are a kind of spiritual lesson. Like I once heard somebody say about Chris, He's so childlike and open to God because of his disability. And I wanted to bring out my left hook. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure Chris would if he heard that statement. A kind of projection by communities which assume certain things about God and God's agency. Even though these kinds of responses can be found in biblical texts, I won't deny that, they trade on bogus ways of representing disability. I want to say that from the start. Namely, that disability is abnormal, that it displays some difference that is unequal, and that the standard human body doesn't have. In other words, a stigma, a faulted blemish, an example of a body gone wrong somehow. But what is normal, and what constitutes a disability? Nancy Iceland, who recently passed away, but who's been a very important figure in disability studies and in theology, uh, describes disability as the consequence of an impairment. That is, an inability to perform some task or activity considered necessary within a social environment. This makes disability, to a large degree, a social construct. That is, disability represents a diminishment relative to a context of evaluation and its own conventions. A lack of ability to function in ways considered valuable by a group not necessarily intrinsic to the person. So in this way, as Leonard Davis, a very prominent disability theorist, describes, disability and normalcy are part of the same system. And this is not a good system. <laughs> impairment does not necessarily mean a disability then. For example, visual impairment in today's world is not a disabling condition because glasses can be worn. But needing a wheelchair or medication for bipolar disorder is. Why the difference? I believe because certain conventions have become status quo and constructed what is normal and thereby created the difference between bodies that are able and those that are disabled. There is more at stake here than in the matter of disability than an impairment someone happens to have for society makes deficits. And often medical communities, I must say, fuel this problem by cultivating curative practices aimed at remedying the so-called deficiency. I've been a part of such things. As Arthur Frank notes, society prefers medical diagnoses than that admit treatment, not social diagnoses that require massive change in the premises of what that social body includes as part of itself. And I would say even our religious communities. So if we grant that the normal is a standard that society constructs, it can also be deconstructed. It can also be brought to critique. And the basis for this deconstruction, in my book I outline it, and I've come to believe really through my relationship with Chris and my contacts with uh, people with disabilities, is that vulnerability, a kind of human vulnerability, something that builds community, indifferences, inequality and respect. It's inescapable, for example, that we are all born, live our lives, and then die as vulnerable creatures needing each other. 
not just to survive as helpless infants, but also to grow and flourish as subjects of our own experience, eventually dying in the care of others, helpless before our mortality. Such vulnerability isn't a curse, but a formative factor that binds us together in mutuality, potentially, with those who accompany us. I'm claiming more than human contingency, then, in the term vulnerability, and more than just simply dependence, because by vulnerability, I also seek to connote a capacity to be wounded and an awareness of that capacity. Highlighting this theme is essential because it provides a way, I think, um, into more vigorously acknowledging and experiencing our deep connecting points with each other, points that indicate a web of basic mutual interdependence, but which all too often becomes cloaked by the exchange values that animate our community, based under what I call the cult of normalcy. Let me spend a second talking about the cult of normalcy for a second, because it is the cult that renders other, other. It routinizes and naturalizes through systems of power and their rituals ways of being human that become taken as convention and the status quo, normal. I can't nuance this the way that I try to in my book and in my ongoing work I'm trying to, but I depend upon the ways feminist and queer theorists have sought to expose and denaturalize masculine and heterosexual hegemony as normative ways of being human, measured against the other, female, homosexual. The cult of normalcy naturalizes what are in fact social constructions, ascribing commonality to a particular standard that becomes prototypical for all. Judith Butler's classic, for example, Gender Trouble, highlights precisely this problem, suggesting that women or heterosexuality is not an essence, but a signification that has meaning in relation to constructed and hegemonic and oppressive systems of binary discourse, women as not male, homosexual as not heterosexual. And I would add, like heteronormity constructs homosexuality as deviant and abnormal, Ableist discourses construct disability as other in order to mobilize representations that uphold communal identities based in binary systems of exclusion. Able, disabled, us, them. Michel Foucault famously, famously speaks of binary divisions, mad, sane, normal, abnormal, in, out, as, quote, the power of normalization, end quote whereby exclusion is not so much ejection from a community as it is productive of that community. Exclusion has formative power. We make an us by excluding them. The excluded supplemental defines the identity, and this makes language itself a vehicle for inscribing, inscribing the normal, so to speak, into our everyday sense of who we are in our religious communities and in our culture as a whole. But there is no natural human. There is no naturally able-bodied person. And because of this, I think there is the chance to deconstruct ableism, opening up multiple vectors of being human together. This is why I believe, rather than what counts for ability, for example, the capacity to think rationally, to be productive, to, uh, to buy things with lots of money as self-interested consumers, we could go on and on with what counts for normal in our society, it's vulnerability that could be a starting point for discovering what we share in our differences, a source bearing the precious and fragile grace of solidarity with one another. And in my work, I depend upon the founder of L'Arche, Jean, Jean Vanier, some, who writes, we don't discover who we are, we do not reach true, true humanness in a solitary state. We discover it through mutual dependency, in learning through belonging. So viewed through the lens of vulnerability, what counts for neediness or lack of ability as deemed by normalcy isn't a flaw, detracting from an otherwise pure and complete human nature, but a testimony to the fact that we receive the gift of who we are along with each other and from each other. This is a source of relational openness, not closure. And recognizing that generally, genuine wholeness is not found through alleged ability, but acknowledged vulnerability in the context of mutual giving and receiving together. It's difficult and painful for
for me to process this notion sometimes in my relationship with Chris. Because as a good parent, I should know what's right and guide him through communities in the right way that contribute to his well-being and mainstreaming and normalization. I've had to confront ways that I, too, have internalized what counts for normal and act these out routinely in my own parenting life. This troubles me, but it also provides hope because insofar as I can recognize this, I can then work to change along with others and the caring circle of community members that I have, we have working around with us. Our identity, our worth, doesn't derive from the power of being a good parent, but rather being a part of community with others that empowers me. And Chris empowers me. I don't give to him, but rather in relationships of mutuality, I learn better how to care and how to be open. Neediness is a difficult reality to accept, though, for it means recognizing that I'm at the core exposed to imperilment and suffering, and that I need another to become who I am. And fragility is at the heart of the need to belong, and, and a fragility that I might fear, a vulnerability that I seek to avoid in multiple ways by being smart in ac academia, smarter than others so that I can, you know, impress with long sentences and multisyllabic words, right? Um, but also in ways that as a parent and in faith communities lead me to fear the different, lead me not to know how to react when encountering people with disabilities. I often presume that security, for example, entails conforming to the projected strength of others around me, bolstered by the conventions of society through acquiescing uh, to the status quo in various ways success stories, productivity stories, stories of health, are all these kinds of images that really impede our capacity to be with one another and to be involved in each other's lives with mutual giving and receiving. And I think the pretense of normalcy is what fuels the efforts to build protective walls around our community and call us us as opposed to them, a fear of the difference and the strange and accordingly judged by our fears, rendered stigma, other, pushed out. But this pushed outness then, in the second shift I'd like us to think about, doesn't necessarily mean, okay, let me be open and welcome in. Because the very inclusion I want to welcome in often assumes that I've already pushed out another. It assumes a them as opposed to an us or a Chris as opposed to me, to put it personally. Doesn't this train of thinking still subject certain kinds of people to inclusion and care as special, precisely because of, of something they are differently? How do we go beyond this? Well, one way is to become critical of it. In fact, the title for my talk, Beyond Inclusion, actually comes from Mary McClintock Fulkerson's last chapter in her book, Changing the Subject, Women's Discourses and Feminist Theology. The title is Beyond Inclusion, and she gets there by ac appreciatively critiquing feminist theology, um, feminist liberation theology, for assuming that the feminist experience of certain texts and practices as oppressive is adequate to describe all forms of gendered subjectivities. Differences of location, she suggests, require taking seriously the, the fact that the empowerment of women may take on a language not immediately compatible with liberation approaches, such as those of a Pentecostal woman, she details in her book, which on the surface may appear misogynist, but at another, le excuse me, at another level are liberative. McClintock Fulkerson notes that feminist discourse is often certified as a kind of universalizing discourse of inclusion from a position of privilege. So in an effort to include and empower women's voices, she suggests some women's voices are actually excluded. The inside being lifted up and defined in a particular, particular way that feigns universality and masks uh, exclusion under the pretense of wide inclusion so that uh, there is equality among women and men but at the expense of differences among women. This is just an example of what I'm thinking about in terms of problematizing inclusion. 
In her work at the vanguard of international feminist writing, Chandra Talpati Mohanty names such inclusionary practices as colonizing. And she encourages caution when Western feminists speak of a common struggle among all women. She questions racialized and sexualized ideologies that mask privilege and challenge this by seeking to reorient feminist solidarity via democratization of women's voices beyond simple inclusion. In fact, she doesn't use that word and critiques the very idea of home in a famous essay. So like McClintock Fulkerson, Mohanty advocates holding differences up as a kind of mirror to dominant feminist discourse, inviting self-critical questions about elements of its identity that its own social location obscures. So, here are the recognitions of differences help destabilize normative assumptions about what makes us, us. Differences become a kind of teacher, not in a patronizing way, but rather opening up communities beyond noble intended inclusion towards acknowledging diversity as productive of life together, not a deficiency. Differences being equal and not incorporated insofar as they might become the same. So differences can be a way to open up self-critique in religious communities. Inclusion, then, is potentially insidious in two ways. First, it trades upon misrecognizing the difference of the, uh, as, excuse me, recognizing the um, difference as other, and in fact names a kind of difference as outside and thus anomalous, something to be brought inside a normative us, an identity. So as Miroslav Wolf bluntly puts it uh, at one point in his book Exclusion and Embrace, inclusion, quote, implicitly portrays them as the kind of people we are not. Inclusion functions by maintaining binary divisions which are inherently exclusive. To be us, we need them to be them. And that's what I want to problematize here. And to be a more inclusive us, we need to be engage them in order that they can then become us. These are problematic. And I've experienced them with educational systems and religious communities related to my son, Chris. For people with disabilities, inclusion is often experienced via a logic that is exclusionary and subsequently assimilative. So all in the name of doing good and taking care. What's needed, I believe, and here's where I embark on the third move in today's visit with you. What is needed is a transformative sense of inclusion that connects members of the community, healing by empowering creative agency, not simply including the helpless or by restoring bodily intactness but an inclusion which opens up physical, social space of non-domination and mutuality. Often practiced, though, are accommodation efforts that are more like tolerance, putting up with, even hospitality. And I've, since writing my book, become more critical of the notion of hospitality, because hospitality can be the host <coughs> trafficking in an abundance, which the host simply offers to the lesser, needy, helpless guest. Those dynamics are not genuine hospitality, but hospitality can function as precisely the kind of inclusion that keeps binary divisions intact and so becomes marginalizing for people with disabilities. So what I want to propose is a kind of spirituality of attentiveness. This is a, a term that I've become through spiritual practices um, of some of my Catholic colleagues at the University of Toronto have opened me up to a deep kind of attentiveness. It's through attentiveness to differences that communities become transformed in a way that doesn't simply accommodate as inclusion, but accommodates with respect and openness and real difference-making love. I've learned this from my own life with Chris, whose life calls out to me, pay attention not to your way, Dad, but to my way, and be with me, accompany me, so first of all, a spirituality of, intentive, of attentiveness is an ethic of accompaniment. What it means to be with another as other. This other evokes in me a response so that my response is a response-ableness or a responsibility. 
accompaniment then is more than just doing for, but it's being with and responding to the summons of another to care on their terms, not mine. So the second point is accompaniment involves a summons that's ethical uh, to its core. I don't have the time to explore the detail in this, um, but I think it's fundamental because it entails a priority given to the other as dignified, equal, and different, as I said earlier. Thirdly, a spirituality of, intenti of attentiveness involves what I'm calling these days a theology of listening, of shutting up, Reynolds. <laughs> Basically, as I sit here and talk, far too often, are, and I'm very sensitive to this because this 2010 is the centennial of the World Missionary Conference, and there are all kinds of, I've been involved with the Canadian response to this, and all kinds of wonderful things about what Christianity has done wrong. The 20th century has been a deplorable century that needs to be, uh, that needs repentance. And the theology of, listen, of listening opens up to the other and hears a word, a story, that then calls me into dwelling with the other. Entering a story different than mine allows me to care in ways that rupture my own securities, sure, but that can potentially be transforming as my relationship with Chris has been. So this spirituality of attentiveness involves accompaniment. It involves an ethical relation with the other, a responsibility, which entails listening. So that finally, speaking and being with is an act of engagement, not doing for, but being with. These are things that I've found, but I believe uh, in my own life as a parent, but I believe can be transformative for our religious communities for it's in the ethical relation with the other and difference that we find traces of a divine presence that's extraordinarily abundant and reshapes the way we think about human nature, human life, and what it means to be human. Disability isn't about them, but about a larger, radically inclusive us. Not just inclusive, but about an us transformed in widely and transformatively inclusive ways. So as I, as I conclude, I just want to basically uh, suggest uh, as a Christian theologian how this meets me. And I'll just use two ideas. One, Emmanuel, the very term, God's solidarity with humanity comes in the shape of a vulnerable human being as experienced in the redemption accomplished in Jesus by Christians. However ways we interpret that, a vulnerable God, the face of that God, becomes apparent in the welcoming, radical inclusivity manifests in the ministry of Jesus. Secondly, some of Paul's writings, as bothered as I am by Paul, actually open up possibilities of thinking of the household of God as a house with many rooms, which doors interlocking and interlacing with one another, such that, as Paul talks about the body of Christ, the, this household of God becomes a place for the spirit to blow. The spirit to blow freely in multiple ways which empower the flourishing of multiple voices. This is radical inclusion, where an us doesn't know simple boundaries, but boundaries are open and transgressed all the time in relationships of listening, giving, receiving, and mutuality, so that a more human church religious community, and perhaps world can take place. I'm going to stop there because I do want to do the listening thing a little too. And, <laughs> no, and, and we've got gifts of a variety of, of people with perhaps questions, and we can talk later. But I, I know that, um, um, yeah, there's a lot of different experiences represented. And so is it OK if I just sort of open it up for thoughts and questions um, and engage on that level? Yeah. Oh, shucks. <laughs> but, I mean, there aren't many people around who are writing the way you're writing, thinking the way you're thinking, and certainly even behaving the way you're behaving. It's just a facade. I don't oh, really, okay. yeah. Uh, do you, have you ever found that, that Chris, would, when you, you come to a certain insight about, about your relationship to him that leads you to believe you're behaving a certain way, 
and it fits the, the development of this door, I think. Yep, yep. And then he rejects that as not meeting the needs of the industrial expectation. Exactly. He proclaims himself, uh, and I think he'd be happy, because I always talk with him. In fact, we talked about this paper, um, because it's really important if we're to honor one another's stories, not to be exploitative with those stories. And so, first of all, I share what I do theologically about our relationship um, to honor him. But also, he proclaims himself an atheist. He's 19. Part of that's a teenage thing, <laughs> maybe against his theological dad. Um, okay, that's you. Well, here's what I am, not you. <laughs> um, and that does challenge me because in a certain way, uh, he is embodying his difference. And I find, well, well, what do, what do I do with that? And especially because, in, and I, he said that I could say this. I didn't put it in my paper, but my relationship with Chris is sometimes hard because of the, the violence that involves parenting. And uh, it's a difficult reality to confront that and think through the anguish as a parent that sometimes comes through with that. But I, well, by vulnerability, what I'm trying to suggest is a kind of openness to my own pain because he resists me. And I'm continually brought back to the relationship uh, looking for new resources for hope, for his well-being in whatever shape that happens, but also for my feelings of inadequacy as a parent. Um, that, that confront me in that. So the ongoing, it's an ongoing kind of uh, dialectic. I've come to be suspicious of that word, but it is kind of a, a back and forth, yeah, approach where I, things I said in that book, I'm rethinking now, uh, scandalous as that is. Uh, especially hospitality, I admitted that. Um, but it, it is true, so thanks for raising that. Yeah. Great question. And in disability studies now, there's a real um, backlash against what's called the social model, that disability is a construct, precisely because impairment is also a construct. And the social model denigrates bodies, or our bodies, and it tends to be pretty much linguistic uh, systemic stratification that the social model talks about. Speaking personally, it is true. Um, my life with Chris is a difficult life. And it's not simply a matter of challenging the normate constructs of society, but dealing with difficulty that's bodily, that's real. The trouble with articulating that is the articulation often falls into the traps of the very system that I'm trying to counter. And so to counter reifications in ways that normalcy kind of prototypically defines impairment and disability makes speaking of bodies difficulty. I don't find much help in the neurodiversity movement, which is now big. Um, in fact, there's a, the new issue of Disability Studies Quarterly. I want to recommend, if you're interested, there's uh, advocates and parents and siblings of people with autism interviewed, and it's like a 60-page email exchange. Brilliant, and they're wrestling with all these things. Well, the social model works, but doesn't work. Well, the medical model of individualizing disability as a problem of the, of the person that needs cure is also faulted. So where do we go? And some of, some of these voices are saying, well, they're just different ways of being human. But the problem with that is some of that entails real suffering. Um, Chris is not happy with who he is. And the danger is simply treating disability as sane among everything. And that's precisely the kind of inclusion I don't want. But so what I can say is, yeah, very difficult. And I'm looking for help in thinking about it. And so are many scholars in disability studies. Yeah. Um, does, does Chris own his autism? I mean, is, mm -hmm. I have a friend who is an adult on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And she talked about for many years she did not know she had autism. Mm -hmm. She struggled greatly with social interactions. Mm -hmm. She married, struggled in a marriage. She had two kids. I felt like she was a total failure. Mm -hmm. 
as a human being. Mm -hmm. So her child was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. And in hearing what the doctors said about why he qualified for a diagnosis of autism, she realized she herself was on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and ended up getting a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And she said so much of her difficulty emanated from the fact that she was trying to be like everybody else and what they expected her to be. Yeah. And once she realized, you know, I'm different and I might as well, you know, celebrate those differences be mm. out there and say, you know, this is who I am. And yeah. um, I, I really, and, and as a parent of a child who is basically nonverbal, mm -hmm. she gives me great insight into her world, at least, yeah. and, and to some degree his world. And I just wondered if, if he's, you know, for lack of a better term, out there flaunting it, you know, that he's on the spectrum. He, well, I just, I, I can't speak for, I wish he were here. Um, he does own it in, in a way, but he is working to come to grips with it. Um, and I've heard a variety of different speakers, some who are out there speaking and claim that, like the neurodiversity voices. Others who are speaking about, well, genetics and science is working to find ways to alleviate the real suffering. Both those are right in certain ways. And Chris kind of vacillates between the two. He, He's very open to medical care and seeks it out. And now he's 19, so he's a consenting adult uh, with this. So that Mary and I, my partner and I, don't just sort of force this on him. But um, disability in terms of autism is a very diverse spectrum. And disabilities are diverse. And there's danger of saying disability and meaning one thing. In fact, saying disability, yeah. It's, it's problematic in itself because it doesn't it, does it reify a construct in ways that deny differences. So he, yeah, he does acknowledge both, but he's not out there um, proud of that because for him, in his particular case, it does involve bodily suffering. Motor tics, um, obsessive thoughts and fears, intrusive thoughts, um, some physical issues as well that are very, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, he directs. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you, you talk about attentiveness, and I'm, I, I follow you on that, and being present to the, to the person that you're subject with or that mm -hmm. you're dealing with. Uh, where do you come in? Do you struggle with it? When do you put it down? My 16-year-old daughter has intellectual disabilities and would and does take up all of my attentiveness for every hour that I'm with her. You're, yeah. I was going to make it. Aren't we superhuman, though? I mean, <laughs> Bill Gaventa, who's a very uh, well-known disability studies, he has a journal, and he once wrote me an email because I was saying yes to too many things. He goes, beware, Tom. You're not superhuman cult of normalcy. Um, <laughs> and as a parent, there are, there is precisely that. What are the limits of this attentiveness? We are embodied. Uh, we do fatigue. And I, I do experience anguish. And I'm working to write about that in a, in a more accessible book. Um, the anguish that accompanies this often, that doesn't go thematized in our religious communities often. We kind of make nice and treat surface things. And so there is a limit. But hopefully, and this is, this is my hope for religious communities, which essentially animates my, my faith life and why I'm still Christian in certain ways is that my hope is we live into this as community because I am not myself alone and I rely on others who become partners in a venture to care. So it's not my project as a hero. The individualist model of, of again, this kind of normate person uh, comes into the fray that I, and it's difficult for me because I tend to want to be right and do everything, but in times I, I can't. So I think acknowledging vulnerability means acknowledging my limitations, real limitations and challenges. Yeah. Sure. I'm just listening in all three because in the past I've been younger than you. Um, and your father's a 19-year-old boy, you see how similar. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Yeah. Everything is good. You're addressing your child. Okay. That's a good thing. My son is different than I am. Yeah. And you know, I, I, and so it's so much stuff that it's it's hard to explain. There's no way for me. <laughs> Trying to put some things on the plate at least for digestion. Yeah, It's problematic and obvious in one way. I mean, I, I think we're saying similar things. That's a lot of percentages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, in fact, that's not what I, I want to not eliminate difference. I want to uphold differences as connected in creative ways that allow communities to flourish. Because often what happens in our communities is differences are denied, either excluded as somehow not like us and therefore inferior or need to be fixed before becoming like us. Um, and, and differences have to be basically nullified, gotten rid of. But communities are differences, precisely what you're saying. We're, we're different. And the difficulty with the binary logic that I tried to highlight, abstract as it is, is that often we find out who we are by demonizing somebody else who's not like us or something other, totally other, which then helps us to feel better about ourselves. Axis of evil, those evilness things out there that can be destroyed allow us to become self-satisfied with our own purity. The good and evil distinction is problematic in its binary quality. So by naming binary in that way, I was mainly trying to say how the inside and the outside are constructed in ways that are really harmful for the real differences that you're naming, because those of us in this room, we're different. In fact, I would say spectrum, no, we're a circle. Um, at one point in the paper that I didn't read, I've, I found real help in Letty Russell's model of a table uh, of hospitality. Uh, Church in the Round is her book, and her recent book on hospitality put together by her partner and student after she died. I use it in a class because it's, it's a beautiful image of a community gathered circularly, not a top or a bottom, not a better or worse, but a community gathered with each other. That's the kind of community in differences, in and through our differences, that I try to live out with Chris in a family and that I'm working towards 
uh, involved with church communities and religious communities, especially among Jewish and Islamic uh, communities in Tor the greater Toronto area. So it's a thank you for your insight. Uh, oh, we have to. Oh, really? That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of great literature out there, and I promised Courtney that I'm going to send a bibliography. So be in touch with the Kennedy Center, and there's great books that are much easier to read. I'm afraid my book's just a cure for insomnia. Um, <laughs> but there are other books out there that are pr address precisely what you're saying, and because I recognize we come from different walks here, some of us academics, some of us uh, parents uh, and advocates in a variety of ways. So anyways. So. Well, I might have continued this conversation in a reception that we have right across the Carpenter Program, right across the <laughs> um, so thank you very much for coming. We oh, really thank, you. It. thank you. Thank you. So right across the hall, Matt. Now for the wine or? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>